League. And Friday means Sean Salisbury. And we'll be coming up with Sean in just a moment. And it is always so great to be with uh, Sean Salisbury on this Veterans Day. And Sean, Veterans Day, I think uh, I, I think you and I had this conversation about our dads uh, being in World War II. My dad was in the Pacific Theater. I share the story of my dad being at Yank or the Apollo Grounds on December 7th, 1941, watching the New York Giants play the Brooklyn Dodgers in a football game uh, as a 15-year-old. And three years later, he would be in the Pacific Theater. But uh, to those out there uh, that served, hey. We, we, we just owe you so much. Happy Veterans Day. Sean, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good, yes. I'm an 82nd Airborne Army son. So, yeah, I uh, much respect and love and thanks to all our veterans who have will and, you know, are serving now. And we're grateful for you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Sean, before we get to the NFL on uh, Sunday, are there any college games that really stick out at you for tomorrow? Any games that really intrigue you? Yeah, I think there's there's a for me a handful. I, I, I go on the Pac-12. Um, Oregon and Washington are both ranked now. The games at Oregon, I think Oregon's gonna, you know, Oregon has to obviously keep pace. And the truth of the matter is, Grant, why this is intriguing? Oregon needs to win out to see USC what the Pac-12. So it, it's odd, but if you're USC, aren't you rooting for Oregon to beat Washington to keep winning? So when you get a chance to play them, your victory, if you can beat them, if you're USC, to with one loss and you can win a Pac-12 championship to get in, pulls more weight. That's one. And that game's in Oregon. Mississippi State plays uh, at home against Georgia. Mississippi State has had their ups and downs, but it's a Mike Leach team. They may throw 70 times in the game. Georgia's coming off an emotional big win. They're the number one team in the country. Could they have a step back? Not saying they're going to lose, but could it be close than we think Ole Miss – is uh, on their way, or excuse me, Ole Miss is hosting Alabama. Alabama should be angry, but Ole Miss can run the shit out of the ball, Grant. That's a that's a dangerous game, and they're the one-win team. My buddy Adam Sager and I we were talking about it earlier today. They're the one-win team. Nobody's talking about them. Everybody we were talking about, they get beat, and now they're done, or the one-loss team, should I say. They get beat, and now we've kind of forgot about them. But if they beat Alabama at home, they're still hanging around for the SEC champ. I mean, they're, they're still in it. You never know. They got a chance, and they run it. So keep an eye on that one. And, you know, the Bill O'Brien stuff, they're, they're frustrated with their offensive play caller at Alabama. Uh, some of the fans are in media, so we'll see about that. And I think a game that really carries national title implications at SMU, not SMU, TCU, on their way to Austin to play the University of Texas. We're having a lot of storms in my area in Houston a couple hours away from Austin. I don't know what the weather's supposed to be game time tomorrow, but Texas Longhorns are favored over the number four team in America at home. Keep an eye on that game, yep. too, because if, if TCU loses, a one-loss team in the Big 12 is not going. They're, they're, they're not playing in the championship, so that would almost eliminate the ACC and the Big 12 from championship hopes, and then we'd be down to three conferences. Yep. Sean, before we get to the games on Sunday, I did a podcast today on Dusty Baker, and Dusty was uh, very – gracious with his time two years ago when he appeared on my podcast and we had an amazing uh, conversation and it's been such an incredible uh, week for him. I know how much Dusty means to you. Uh, I've talked about how much he means to me being in Sacramento and where Dusty is from. I've known Dusty for, gosh, I don't know, over 25 years. His dad was a fixture at the Kings games. And, but I, I want to talk about the Astros real quick. Did I just read that your GM turned down the deal? Uh, he, he was yeah. only offered a one year deal. How about that? What do you think? Yeah, about and I, that? I think they, I, I was grand, I was running errands this afternoon. I think the assistant GM was was fired too. Yes, order. I think so. Yes, so I, I think, think so too. Of, and and J, James just didn't come to the deal on new contract. Now, I got some insight, you know, with James because he was on my show every week all season long. Mm -hmm. Every Wednesday, James Click joined us and he was generous with his time and very good and did a nice job. Here's what it is, Grant, and it's, I don't mean it disrespectfully either way. First, let me start with Jim Crane, great owner, yep. shrewd businessman, 
high expectations. People love him because he wins and he knows how to do it, but he doesn't, there's certain things he doesn't budge on grant. And it's, you're not paying Correa all that money or Springer let Cole go. He's not, if it cost him four years at 50 million a year, he wouldn't sign Verlander. If that's the case, you know what I'm saying? He's mm-hmm. very, he's not going to go over any luxury tax with players. He loves dusty. Dusty won. And I know optics. I don't think Jim Crane much cares about the optics of what the fans think because he is he really, and you can't, I mean, you got to care about the fans, but you can't let them make franchise decisions. A lot of people still crave Jeff Luno here. I, I'm saying I hear it all up and down social media on my radio show. James Click did a nice job. I don't think they ever, at least the talk in town, they were never on the same page, Click and and uh, Jim Crane. Jim offered him, a, you know, he was going to make a million bucks and he was going to offer him a one-year deal. And it turned out to be a take it or leave it. I get Jim Crane's side. I think Jim Crane believes that they're going to win whether James Click is there or not, but respects what he did there because he did a nice job. But I think Jim also knows that there'll be people standing in line. Who doesn't want to be the GM for an Astros team that you know can go back and win it again? They're loaded, right? Absolutely. With a, and a manager who's easy to deal with, right? And then James Click on his side. Come on, man. You just won a World Series. Yep. You, 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 you're a million dollars a year for a general manager, Grant. I know mere mortals can't fathom it, but that, that's a low paid general manager for a championship team. Offered it, didn't take it. I think he made it an offer that was easy to refuse for James mm-hmm. Click. I don't blame James Click for taking it. He's going to go somewhere that wherever he goes, it's not going to be as easy to win. But right. for a million dollars, and I know respect comes into it, and I know they have mutual respect, but I don't think they were ever on the same page. And he made him an offer, wasn't going to give him more than one year. And he said no, and he moved on. So I don't think it's going to have a major effect on the team. James Click did a nice job, and I was grateful for him on our show. I trust Jim Crane's uh, compass because he hadn't been wrong very much over the last six, seven years, Grant. I don't think he'll be wrong on this, although I think James Click's really good, and this will be a great learning experience. It was his first GM gig, three years of it. You were in the World Series twice. It's not a bad not, not, not a bad way to start your GM career, but Jim Crane, it was a basic take it or leave it. I'm not giving you more than one year, and he decided to leave it, and both of them will move on and have success, I'm sure. All right, NFL Carolina wins last night, and that really sets up Tampa to start taking control of this division. And they're in Munich, and boy, I'll tell you, what a long trip that is for Seattle, a four-game win streak. I'm intrigued by this game because of what I saw at the end of the game from Brady and the Bucks. But, I mean, if you're going to put these two teams head-to-head, Seattle right now is clearly the better football team. I think this is a close game. Give me your thoughts on this matchup in Munich yeah, I, on Sunday. I, I, I do, too. The three-point favorite is Tampa um, on the road for both of them. Uh, listen, Grant, I, you know what? I'll tell you one thing. The Rams probably could have closed out the Tampa Bay Buccaneers season, mm-hmm. but they're in the South. But It would have been a different look. You give Brady a ball back. It seems like every time they're in a, a crunch in his career, there's a, there's a defining moment. The question is, is this the light switch for Tampa coming back against the Rams and make a throw where it's like, I watched uh, Leftwich and Brady hug on the sidelines. I'm talking about emphatically after at the end of that game. And it hit me, I thought, is this a turning point? Now, you still got to play and be healthy and do it all. Yeah, yeah. But is this is this the light switch turning point for Tampa where they go and win six in a row and they get to January and Brady's playing like, oh, hell. Because I know when he gets to January, it's different, right, Grant, with, with Brady. So we'll see there. And Geno Smith might be the MVP in the league. 15 mm-hmm. touchdowns, four picks, 2,200 yards. I think it's going to be a close game. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, if Tampa Bay wins this football game, I, w- I would keep a close eye on their ascent because the NFC's winnable by anybody. We know who Philadelphia is. It's yep. going to be a good game. I, I like Tampa in the game, and we'll see. I don't believe in game-to-game momentum. I do believe in game-to-game confidence and feel good. We'll see if they can carry it over and who travels well. I did. A, we had a preseason game I played in in Berlin, which was a phenomenal experience. But it's a business trip, even though yep. it's a trip where you're, you're going somewhere that most of them probably haven't been. But keep an eye on Tampa. But Seattle, trying to win the division. It's been a hell of a run for them. And, Grant, can I make a point real quick? Look, I want you to think about what you thought about the NFC quarterbacks in August. As we sit today, Mariota could be one, but think about it. Cousins, Brady. Hertz, Prescott, Garoppolo, uh, Geno Smith, and Daniel Jones. That's your NFC playoff, playoff quarterbacks right now. Wow. Now, and Heineke and Mariota are sitting outside, uh, sitting outside looking in, right? 
Yep. And you think about that and say, well, I guarantee that wasn't on our list of the quarterbacks who were going to be in the NFC playoffs, a couple of them. So I like Tampa in this football game, maybe a turning point for them if they can get two in a row. I really think there's a changing of the guard at the quarterback position with some of the older quarterbacks, which gets me to Green Bay, and they have Dallas coming in. And it just seems the Packers are a mess right now. I don't know if you believe some of the things that we're reading as it relates to the players getting tired of Aaron Rodgers' act. And, you know, he talks a lot. He had a horrible game, maybe as bad as he's played coming off this week. And, you know, he goes on the Pat McAfee show every week on Sirius X, or I guess it's not Sirius XM anymore, but, you know, on Pat McAfee show on Tuesdays. So do you believe what you – hearing about players are maybe tuning out Aaron Rodgers? Oh, I think, I think over time, the more you can, you know, my affinity for Rodgers, I think he's a great player, but I also, he's, he's not above criticism. Last week he was awful. Terrible. He, 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 quite frankly, offensively, it's one of the worst games I've seen him play. He was the reason they missed out on some, he, they're, they're down in the red zone. He missed some incredible opportunities and threw some, some silly picks down there. Um, and he goes on. Yeah, I would think that over time, Greg, you know how this is. When it's the same story every week, people turn it into white noise, right? It's like, yep, okay, yep, headset, yep. I'm done. Don't want to hear it anymore. And then when you're not playing your best, they about they start to say, wait a second, you're pointing at us, talking about us every week. Is there three fingers pointing back at you and a thumb, right? So I, I think, Grant, I don't know if I believe it all. Somewhere in the middle of the frustration. I know there's frustration. It's the first time in a decade that I have looked at Aaron Rodgers in a game and I've thought where he has that smirk that it's not there anymore. Yep. It, it's not there. I don't think they can overcome it. I don't think they're making the playoffs. I don't think they're no. beating Dallas. I think, nope. I think you can stick a fork in him. And if you're the Dallas Cowboys, you get yourself going. Prescott, you continue to expand the offense. Pollard needs to be your go-to guy on a regular basis. And you need to change up with, with Zeke, keep them both in the game, spread out Pollard, do everything you can. Because if you can score on them, I'm not sure how many points the Green Bay Packers can actually score on the Cowboys, to be honest with you, Grant. I don't know how Aaron Rodgers is going to stay upright in this game. I, I really don't. And I I think this could get really ugly for Green Bay if Dallas gets the momentum early, Sean. I think that's what maybe you were just referring to. This could be an ugly Sunday afternoon for the Packers and their fans. Yeah, I got a fork in them, but it'll be a pitchfork if they lose this game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It'll be big yeah. and done. Yeah, well, all right, so that's a game. And, and you know, when we talk about teams in the NFC, to me, in the NFC East, there's Philadelphia and there's Dallas. I'm sorry, I'm a diehard Giants fan. I love the Giants, but they're not ready for that stage just yet. They're, they're, they're a, a second year. level right now yeah, still. That's yeah, right. second that's level. That's fine. Right. That's fine. Yep. I, I, and, listen, in the NFC West, you have Seattle and San Francisco. And although San Francisco, to me, will win the division, I think they're the better team. I can't ignore what the Seahawks have done, Sean. How can I ignore that? They're four, they won four in a row. They're atop the division. And guess what? You know what? Th th they are turning people like me into believers every week. How can I not believe on what the Seahawks have done? How long can we keep saying, well, when are they going to go away? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we keep saying it. They're not going away. And – Grant, if they were winning, going six out of 16 with the quarterback, rushing for 90 yards, but getting a couple turnovers on defense, like you know what I'm saying? But they're winning a lot of different ways. Defense is playing good football. They, they can run it. And Geno Smith is playing lights out. Pete Carroll is like, he's like it's a rejuvenated there. Think about this, too. They're, if Geno plays like this, they're not going to have to draft a quarterback. I know we've talked about it. They're not going to have to draft a first-round quarterback, which they planned on doing. And they also have – what's what is it uh, – they have Denver's pick because of all the Russ Wilson assets, That's right? right? So they, they, they are. They, I think they thought, well, we'll just compete. Yep. We'll see what happens in the draft. Now you're looking around, saying, ten weeks into the season, are you damn, you damn right, we're going to win this division? That's the way they think. I love the way they're playing. I'm buying in. I think they're a playoff team. Yeah. Now, I still think the 49ers. If all, if they played to get in January against each other, I'm taking San Francisco. Me and too. I don't even care where they play it. But, I don't care. but, but Seattle. If they don't, if they, if they don't go deep in the playoffs, they're going to disrupt this picture along the way because I like the way they're playing and I love the energy they're playing with and their fans are back at it, you know, with that loud crowd. Uh, Garrison asked about the 49ers having so many offensive weapons. Yeah. So speaking of that, we uh, we'll see how many they win on the remaining schedule. But Debo Samuel's coming back. They've got the Chargers on Sunday, and I got to tell you, it is going to be very interesting to see Kyle Shanahan's offense with Samuel. 
with Kittle and obviously with Christian McCaffrey now, that could be a dynamic-looking offense. They've got the Chargers. And, Sean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Justin Herbert. I, I just think the guy, not having Keenan Allen on the field for most of the year, to me, has got to be a huge a huge issue for him. And, Grant, I, I, you know, I watch them every week. I, I They don't push the ball vertically down the field the last couple. It's like they're, they're trying they, – they, I also don't think they want – you know, Herbert taking hits with the injury he's been dealing with. The ball's coming out. They're not making the home run. I'm talking about the grand slam, big chunk plays. 49ers defense is going to give them all kinds of different looks. And their running game is inconsistent, right? At one week, you think, oh, Eckler, and they're going to run it. Then the next week, they throw it 40 sometimes. I like the 49ers in the game. I think their defense can force a few turnovers. If Herbert doesn't play great football, they're, they're not going to win. He, I mean, and that, that's a burden to bear. And the 49ers can move it because even regardless of how many touches Bo and McCaffrey have, going into this game, Brandon Staley, the head coach in his defense, just understanding the deployment and the confusion by moving those guys around, these are the best chess pieces Kyle Shanahan's had as, as, as court, uh, offensive coordinator slash head coach yep. in San Francisco. And I would deploy them all over to create confusion and get, misma get mismatches. I think you're going to see another elevation of San Francisco's game. And Jimmy Garoppolo can't help but be better uh, con con considering um, the weapons he now has to work with, and they're getting healthy. What do you think about this from Cody about Herbert's ribs? You know, we he had a very significant rib injury a couple of weeks ago. You've been there. You've played the position. Do you look at that as a factor in his play? I, I do. Um, now, the question is, I don't know his threshold of pain, Grant. You know, unless they don't give you any inside secrets. I mean, you know, his buddies may know where he's saying, man alive, man, I'm playing at 75%. There's no doubt. Plus there's that inevitable, it's like when you got a bad thumb, like if you broke your thumb like I have, it gets hit all the time, right? You mm -hmm. bang it into stuff, same thing. Inevitably, when it gets hit, you know where he's going to get hit, right? Uh, and that's the only place you can hit a guy in the midsection anyway. So I think it's had an effect. Now, he's a tough SOB because he's played through it, but – you know, it, it, it hangs around. And I think like a sore hamstring, it'll linger. So I don't know. I, I don't think he's playing at 100 percent, but I don't know what his threshold of pain is. If he's out there, guess what? We can only judge him by what he's doing is on the field if he's playing. But there's no way he's 100 percent after how how much he hurt. And then he's, he keeps playing every week. Yeah, it's a factor. And the fact that they don't have a they're, they're not hitting home runs right now is a factor as well. The question is, can they beat the 49ers playing sideways football and horizontal football? Uh, they can, but Herbert's going to have to play as, about as good a game as he's played all year in this one. I, I think the biggest story right now is in Buffalo with Josh Allen. We don't know if he's going to play yet on Sunday. Uh, I guess he averted a real serious elbow injury, but there is an issue. And again, we don't know about Sunday, but just keeping an eye on him the rest of the way. You, you and I have talked about this, and I think it's not, not that we need to talk about it. The Bills aren't winning the Super Bowl without Josh Allen. So they're, they're holding their breath up there in Buffalo. No doubt. And I, I'm sitting here wondering, where, where, at what point does Sean McDermott, I know it's Friday, say, okay, 75% or 80%, we're not playing him this week. Right. Now the Vikings, we're, we're about to find out how good the Vikings are over the next three weeks. They got them, they got Dallas, and they're going to Buffalo to play. But the Vikings are – People, that's another team. People are saying, are the Vikings real? They played like four backup quarterbacks against, but they're still doing it in good fashion and winning different ways. But Buffalo, I'm with you, Grant. But they do the smart thing. They went out and what traded for Case Keenum. Yep. And they got a guy who's played in this league and yep. won and can hold it down. So good point. if there's any question, if you think like if you think Josh Allen at 80% is better than Case Keenum, then go with well, it. But if the risk is there, you since it's a home game. Play Case Keenum. He knows about he knows all about this, and he's yep. been down this road before. I, I wouldn't risk it, but I'll tell you what: Miami's in that uh, objects in mirror closer than they appear. They're not going away right now. Greg. Look at the Jets. Look at the Jets. I mean, the Jets and the Dolphins are a game back. Absolutely. The <clears throat> I mean, we thought Buffalo would would I don't want to say win the division in a cakewalk, but we thought they would be clearly the team that's going to win that division. No we can't say that right now. And how long does it last, Grant? What if he was out there throwing and all of a sudden it bothers Allen if he plays and then two more weeks go by where he can't play and now we're into December or late November and you start to wonder, well, is this yep. going to linger the whole year? If it's, listen, when it comes to the Tommy John area, the UCL, nerve, oh, I mean, the, the ligament, it, it, it's dangerous. There's no question yes. because if he has surgery, he misses the all the next year if he waits till the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it's not that serious because – I think we all want to see Josh Allen and the Bills at their best. 
Um, and I hope they do because he is an unbelievable weapon. But they got there's got to be a threshold of he didn't practice all week. Case Keenum did. Maybe maybe Case Keenum knows how to go out there, and he does knows how to go out and win a game. I would expect if it gets close, I'm almost leaning towards Keenum playing. But we'll see how Josh uh, Allen's threshold of pain is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just win once. To win. <laughs> you know your analysis on the Raiders, who were just one play away from beating Cincinnati in the playoffs last year and what's happened. I don't know if there's just one simple answer to that question about what's happened to the Raiders. No, it's not. Grant, think about this. You can go down a, a litany of things. One is their offensive production and play is putrid. The coach seems like he's clueless, and I know he's smarter than that. The defense can't stop anybody. Um, your best player on offense doesn't seem to get the ball as often as he needs to. Uh, Renfro's now on IR. Um there, I mean, it's it, it, every single day. Now that we're talking about four first rounders over the last since what 2019, whatever it is in the last four years, four first rounders are, are gone, and two other first rounders they did not pick up their fifth year option. That's six. That's that's franchise changing. Totally. And the Raiders have not. They, they, yeah, it is it, it, how putrid their picks have been, and and they're scrambling around. Now they got the Colts and the Colts with the, the reason Jeff you got to watch this game. The, yeah, the reason you got to watch this game is Jeff Saturday's coaching. What's going to happen? Are they going to play with energy? And right. if I'm if I'm Indianapolis with Sam Ellinger or I don't care who plays quarterback, I would Jonathan Taylor might be sitting in a whirlpool for six weeks after I'm done running him this week. <laughs> and I'm going to dare the Raiders to shorten the game and get out of there. They yeah. are it, it is pretty putrid seeing what they're doing. But you know what? It's the Raiders. They could go out and score 40 this week, and everybody goes, oh, look, and then go score eight next week. So who the hell knows? I'm anxious to see how Saturday yeah. handles his team, though. You know Jeff Saturday, right? I do. Leader. I mean, what do you think? I, I, right, I, I, so great. Leadership. I mean, but there you played for a lot of coaches. So is I mean, there are a lot of characteristics that go into being a good head coach. And, you know, talent That's one of them. Although I look at the Giants and the Seahawks, where I didn't think their talent level was that high. I enter in the season. Look what you're doing. So, is that where we're at? Leadership, right now, with yeah, your Saturday. And Grant, without an off season, and here you got to pick and choose. You don't. You don't get a training camp to get to know the fellas. So you got to. You got to grab those players and coaching staff, and you got to get buy-in from them early. Listen, when I live, watch Jeff address the media about this, he's not dumb. Jeff knows what people are saying about this. About how could you do this? How could you hire? It's a relationship hire. Of course it is. A lot of hires in football. Coaches, they bring their buddy, our relationship hires. He knows football. He's smart. He 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 does know how to lead men. The question is, can you get him to buy in quick? And they're not overly gifted. They're not that good. So that way we can say all we want, good or bad. But what if they go seven and one? Now, with the slap in the face that it was to the coaching profession, are we going to say, maybe this is the way to go? The truth is, Grant, when you, you spend all the years as an assistant trying to be a head coach and knowing the X's and O's, and when you get to be a head coach, you become the CEO. Right. You went from mid manager to sales boss to vice president of a company to CEO. Now you get to delegate and hope that the guys you hired around you are great and you got to be a leader. So in his position, you want to maximize the building and you want to get great leadership. And then truth, since he's late to the party, it's buy in for him and seeing if he can get guys to say, you know what, that's the type of coach I want to play for. Let me see how he can maximize it. Jeff, how much impact can he have on X's and O's at this stage, Grant? No training camp. Yep. You can't change the playbook. Let me say this, though. So I'm rooting for Jeff. It's not his fault. If you want to blame Ursay, went about it because he trusts Jeff Saturday. Okay. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, well, then Jeff knows he'll be back doing TV. That being said, everybody's all over Jeff Saturday and getting on him and, and, and the, the coaching profession. I understand the hire was unconventional. But what if the same team – same alpha leader. What if it was Peyton Manning that the Colts hired? What would the narrative be? be uh, what, what, what would they be saying? Oh, you know, great but, hire. But you, that's right. You and I both, they would be saying. But I, I'm with you on that. It's just this whole story is very, very strange to me. But there, there's two sides to the story. It's either it's going to work or it's not going to work. And then what happens if it's the latter? What do the Colts do going into the offseason? Well, what well, does that do for the credibility? of the franchise and ownership and right. everything else it's a mess and it also it also when you go out and try to get out if you have to go get a new coach and it's a guy who's been a coach or you you, you you covets the job but you say well are they is it a is it a clown organization they did this why would i want that job right but grant think about this though 
the narrative, honestly, I'm Saturday is a center. He's not a yep. quarterback. If if it was Peyton Manning that Jim Irsay hired, we wouldn't be hearing whispers, not roars over. Yep. How could you hire somebody that wasn't a coach simply because one guy took the snaps from center? Yep. And Peyton's obviously as bright as it gets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And good. But so is Saturday. Put it this way. Jeff Saturday was the Peyton Manning of centers with his leadership. So exactly the right. point is, is that Jeff's going to take criticism, but it doesn't look like to me like he gives a shit. And as a head coach, you can't. And like he said, if it works, great. I get to coach. If it doesn't, yep. then they're going to go. They, they got to go through the hiring process when the season's over, no matter what. Because remember, he's got the interim label. In the offseason, they're going to have to go through the Rooney rule and all the things they do to get a firm full head, full-time head coach. It doesn't look like it's it, it's going to work. You would think it's not because, quite frankly, it's not a very good team. But I sure hope that, uh, that Jeff has success. But I also hope the coaches realize we respect the business more than thinking you could pull, plug some guy off the street who played football and he becomes a great head coach overnight. Jeff's got a lot to learn, and so does Jim Irsay. Justin Fields, three weeks ago, they changed play callers, and I think they're utilizing his skill set more. He's coming off an incredible game, both, you know, and again, he uses his running ability now. In, in, in what he did last week was incredible. What do you have, 178 yards? on the ground when you watch him are we also just looking at the evolution and the maturation process of, of a young quarterback who now has seen defenses has had more sundays yeah. prepared for getting the rhythm and the routine down all of that put together sean yeah grant i'll tell you what i've been watching him closely he looks like he's back at ohio state yep the light switch is at the last month this dude looks like a friggin' alien on the field. He, he really does. I, you know, the talk, I mean, he, and he doesn't have that many good players offensively. He doesn't. And they've put him in position to accentuate and that's the sign of a great coach. You don't put a sprinter running a marathon. You don't put a pocket pass or run an option. You got a Justin Fields who does it all maximize the skill set, use it all. And it looks like he's starting to process it faster, which is the normal match. Grant, we're in year two on a guy. He's on a second coordinator and second head coach, right? Mm -hmm. in, in two years. And he doesn't have any weapons for the most part. I'll tell you what, the games I've watched the last two or three weeks, this dude, if this continues and they keep coaching him like this and get him players, you are looking at a nightmare to have to game plan against. He's big, physical. Now it's just the process of accuracy, getting weapons, and the pass game. Right now, he's a, you don't want to have to game plan him. You, you do not want it because he is miserable to game plan against. But I have watched the light switch go on. He is a dangerous dangerous uh, football player right now on a team that seems to be dangerous because of him and they're playing better, but get him some weapons and look out. And Cody, to answer your question, do I think the che Texans have a chance to beat the Giants? Yeah. Five point underdogs. They have a chance, but uh, the, the Texans just aren't good. The, te the Texans are good. If they both play their best football, the Giants are winning. The Texans, I don't know how they're going to take, I don't know how they're going to uh, tackle um Saquon, uh, Barkley. Saquon Barkley in space. I, I just don't. I'd run the football. Daniel Jones is playing better. I trust Brian Dable right now more than I do Lovey Smith when yep. it comes to the approach offensively. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the Giants in the game, but they do have a chance. Well, the Giants are also coming off a bye. I always like yep. that at this part of the season. I think that makes a big difference. So agreed. Giants at home uh, should win this game. Arizona Cardinals, LA Rams. Those teams especially the Rams, have been two of the more disappointing teams. I, I guess I shouldn't lump the Cardinals in there with how bad they were in the second half of last year and how putrid and pathetic they looked in the playoff loss against the Rams. I, I can't imagine that coach staff surviving moving forward. Can you? Talk about the Arizona? Yeah, yeah Arizona. I, 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 I Grant, it seems like uh, – and you start to see people getting chippy on the sidelines where Hopkins is telling Murray, what are you looking at? You know, the middle of the 50 is open and they're going back and forth and – they're missing protections, and Cliff Kingsbury's running around. I would think if this continues the rest of this season, that the owner may give the general managers uh, a, a little bit of a you got a choice. You can stick around and risk going, or you might have to let that guy. I, it, it it hasn't it has it's not working now. They've gotten better in the regular season the last couple of years, but the end of the year, Grant, I mean, we have recency bias, and the way they're playing this year, they look like a team that's lost. And the quarterback spectacular one minute and doesn't understand where the blitz is coming from the next. I've watched a ton of tape on him this past week, and he's a talented quarterback. But it seems like the gimmicks – it feels gimmicky to me. I don't think you're going to – in 2025, I don't think this combination is going to be the quarterback and head coach together. That's just my guess. I don't wish it on anybody, but that's my guess. What's your take on this question with the Titans? Um, 
uh, give it to the, the to give it to the king in the backfield 425 times. Um, the truth is, listen, Willis hasn't been ready to play. When Tannehill's 100% healthy, they're better. They have no perimeter threat for the most part on the outside. If they don't run it well and get turnovers and play great defense, now, I can tell you this: you want a street fight and toughness, they'll they'll battle anybody. That team will fight you, and that's what they're going to win the division because the Colts aren't any good. Uh, Jacksonville's up and down. The Texans aren't good. But I put more respect on Mike Vrabel's team. They just don't have weapons. But when Tannehill's in there, at least there's the threat right now. Willis is young. He's only started a couple games. we got to give him a chance. But Tannehill knows it. Play action becomes more effective. You can't go 6-15 of and win in this league for long. So when the quarterback's healthy and not in a walking boot in the past, they'll be better. But your best remedy and the best way for them to win is get the short field, play defense and give the ball to the big fella 35 times until Tannehill's 100% healthy. The problem is, as we go on, Grant, and they face teams like the Bills or the Chiefs in the playoffs, they're going to they have to win 17 to 14 games. They can't get in a shootout yep. because they do not have guys on the edge. I didn't realize, well, I did, but not this big, how great it was going to be for A.J. Brown to go to Philly and what a difference it was going to make. I knew it would make a difference. And, ha- and just how much the Tennessee Titans miss him. He has made one team much richer, and he has made another team much poorer on the edge. He's a hell of a football player. Tennessee doesn't have enough weapons to be playing in February, January, because they're going to win the division. Sean, I noticed you just started another podcast with another guy, uh, and I think you might even have it being behind you, being promoted. Maybe I'm wrong. I can't see tell for sure, but tell people about that new podcast you're doing. It's called Lance Last Chance Q, and it's a really hardcore Football, we evaluate quarterbacks. We watch NFL All-22 tape. We do uh, lingo. We take you through basically a teaching manual with opinion, Grant, right, on football stuff. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, you, you remember Coach Brown who did Last Chance U? Yep. The head coach there. So we call it Last Chance Q. And it's a really deep dive because we got NFL tape and college tape where we can evaluate. And we also got segments where we – you know, like I said, we talk about how to attack and what goes on in coaches' meetings and players' meetings. And we also, every week now, uh, evaluate, send us your tape, we'll evaluate it for you. You're a high school, college pro guy, send it back. And it's been good. He's a fiery guy. JB's awesome. But the hardcore X's and O's, and it's a strict football show, we'll mix in stuff. But unlike us, we talk everything. We are going X's and O's with, you know, telestration and and some hardcore stuff and if you like football shows i don't believe and we've only done two i don't believe you're going to find a better football show when it comes to the x's and o's and the inside stuff um, of where we've been with him and i and talking football i don't think there's a better internet show on the planet when it comes to the x's and o's drawing it up and teaching it you do it once a week Just twice a week. Twice we do it uh, on yeah. tuesdays and thursdays awesome we'll look forward last hey. chance q thank you my man i appreciate it yeah, of course. My pleasure. And uh, enjoy your weekend, Sean. We'll talk to you Monday, buddy. Right, man, I love you, and I love doing this show, and I miss you in person, but I can't wait to see you. Thanks for everything, You're but have best, a good man. weekend. Appreciate Thank the you. hell out of you. That's Sean Salisbury, man. Great stuff right there, really. This show brought to you by New Works Plumbing of Sacramento. Locally owned for over 20 years, New Works has a fix for you. Just go to sacserviceplumbing.com or call the number on your screen. Remember, they're available 24-7 if you have an emergency in the middle of the night. New Works Plumbing, Sac serviceplumbing.com. You can check it out. All right, the Kings tonight, they are in action against the Lakers, and Ryan and Sacktown is with us. How are you, buddy? Doing great. How about yourself, Nate? I'm doing good, and this is a good opportunity for the Kings to get on a roll this weekend. The Warriors also play tonight against the Cavaliers. They have not won a road game, so the Kings get them on Sunday. Two wins this weekend would put Sacramento up at 500. Again, this is a de- Completed Lakers team with a LeBron James injury. No excuse for the Kings not winning this game tonight. None. Yeah, no excuses. In fact, they're four and a half point favorites. Uh, With LeBron not playing, I think it's really time for them to actually bring the game to the Lakers rather than let the other team bring the game to them and react. Um, Yeah. And uh, it'd be nice to see him, you know, get up pace, just really, really have a good game all around, get the bench going again, um, and keep Sabonis out of foul trouble. Um, because playing against Davis, that's going to be a tough matchup for him. Yeah, LeBron won't be playing, and I, I didn't even know, know this about Anthony Davis, uh, that he's questionable with a non-COVID illness. So, you know, again, the Lakers are a mess with with Anthony Davis, with LeBron, without it. Really, they, they have two wins. I mean, no matter how you look at it, they've got some big-time issues in that locker room. 
Yeah, they absolutely do. I mean, obviously with the Westbrook situation and everything going on, um, that's kind of been following them for the most part. And, you know, they're, they're getting older, Grant. We've talked about yes. that. And so this is a good game to get out and run, maybe press them a little bit. I say that all the time, but press them and, you know, make Russ bring the ball up, um, you know, give them a little pressure, see how they react, get them tired. We're younger than them. Anita's 100% correct that there is no excuse, even if LeBron was playing, uh, just get the W. And so, you know, we start this new five game stretch that I always talk about. I like to go in five game increments of the road game tonight and you come home for four and mm -hmm. then the schedule gets really deep. So, yeah. Yes, I agree with Anita. Get, get the W. The bench, you mentioned the bench. The bench is becoming a big story for Sacramento. It is. Malik Monk's been playing really well. Um, Trey Lyles playing really well, a little bit inconsistent. Uh, Metsu, oh my gosh, he's brought the spark. I mean, there's been at least one or two sparks every single game, uh, whether it's an alley-oop, uh, you know. So the bench is starting to form together. And, you know, what I like is nobody's position is safe on that bench. So uh, Mike Brown is not scared to mix it up, but he is going to play the hot hand, and he's shown that thus far this season. And don't forget, after the game tonight, I'll be right back here on YouTube with a Kings-Lakers post-game show. That's going to be getting underway roughly 10 o'clock Pacific. I might come on a few minutes early. I may start the stream at 9.45, and then we can pick it up when the game gets towards the end. So just keep that in mind right here on YouTube Live. We had a great show the other night, Brian. I mean, we had, what, 200 people uh, watching. And then coming up on Sunday after the Warriors game, I'm going to be on Listen app. And then that's a, for folks that don't know that's interactive where you can actually call me. And we can take phone calls and talk about the game. So that will be on Listen app on Monday. So I'm looking forward to this weekend. It's going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the uh, the post game show the other night was great. You were in a ranty mood, and I think the fans really enjoyed <laughs> that. Uh, let's hope for uh, some more fun and celebration tonight, and positives to talk about with the Kings. All right, though we get uh, a lot of different questions on a different. I'm getting a lot of Ohio State questions about you know, do I like Big Blue or Ohio State? I don't know if I've shared the story with you, but uh, I hate Ohio State, and I always root for Ohio State to lose and every single thing they play. My freshman year in college, we were playing a lacrosse game at Ohio State in the horseshoe. And I'll never forget it because when I walked out onto the field to warm up, they had just had their spring football game. And I walked right past Arch Leister, their star quarterback, who later would have a huge gambling problem and be in prison. And Arch Leister was a godlike figure. And I remember him standing in the end zone with his number 10, jersey on and they had just finished playing their spring game there were still probably 30,000 fans in the stadium and I just thought wow you know I was an 18 year old kid walking out of the locker room and I scored five goals in that game uh, at Ohio State as a freshman and I remember after the game somebody had broken into our locker room and all of our valuables and I had had a watch that my dad had given me for graduation from high school and it was gone so I remember on Monday I wrote a handwritten letter to the athletic director at Ohio State. His name was Hugh Hinman, all right, handwritten letter explaining to him what happened and how unfortunate it was that they could not, you know, keep a locker room, you know, locked up and secure. And I didn't ask for money. I didn't. I just wanted him to know what had happened and how unfortunate yeah. it was. Never even, never even received the obligatory thank you, we're sorry, nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing at all from Ohio State. So I, I don't root for Ohio State in anything. That's terrible. I mean, at least have your secretary or yes. the assistant to the assistant yep. to the assistant yep. film manager pen something out, especially something that special coming from your father. Um, you know, it's different times. And, uh, you know, now they've got the, you know, safes and stuff for the guys in their lockers. But, yeah, that's terrible. I don't root for Ohio State in anything either. And, actually, I was surprised on your Listen app show that you picked the Cowboys this week. I, I uh, did not pick the Cowboys. I picked the Cowboys not as one of my picks. I don't believe I picked them as one of my picks. I believe I, or did I did I pick them as one of my picks? Because I didn't think I, I think did. But, you, I think you well, got you know the what? Cowboys. All right. Well, I'll have to go back and look. 
I can't even remember who I picked. Here's what I do know. I'm in last place and I got it like for a few days. I got to put my personal hatred aside and start winning some picks because I'm in last place. You know, maybe that's what it boils down to, you know? <laughs> it is time. It's desperation time, baby. Now you've got plenty of football left. Yeah. So. Well, somebody just said on Sunday, um, uh, somebody said on Sunday, the Kings are going head to head with the 49ers. So when I go and listen up after the Kings game, we'll make it both. If you want to talk 49ers, we can do both. Okay. That way I can appease sure. the uh, Northern California audience, you know? So sure. Sure. And the listen app is so easy for anybody that doesn't have it. You just download the app, you find Grant's show. And uh, if you raise your hand, uh, Grant will call on you and you get to talk to him. So it'll be a cool change of pace. Yep, Ask absolutely. a question, have a debate. All right. Kings win by more than 10 points tonight. I will say, yes, they do. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. Um, yep. I, I'm thinking probably about 14, 14 to 15 is yep. my range. And then on Sunday, the Warriors, and you and I both know this, there will be a lot of Warrior fans at the Golden One Center. It would be nice to shut them up for once. It would. Uh, they're a little bit obnoxious. Uh, but same thing, you know, when the Lakers come to Golden One as well. We get a lot of Lakers fans. So uh, it would be nice to play the same type of basketball we played against them in Golden State and, uh, you know, keep this streak alive. Just not even winning streak, but keep the streak of consistent play. That's what I'm looking for. Yep. Consistent, hard play. By the way, I did my podcast today on Dusty Baker, and I had Dusty on my podcast uh, two years ago, and I played a couple of excerpts from that that I thought were relevant to what's going on now with him. And uh, he'll be honored at an upcoming Kings game, and I can't wait for to see what that's going to be like. I mean, Sacramento's very own. What a class act. And so if, if you missed my podcast today, check it out. Dusty Baker, as good as it gets. Total class act. Uh, seen him at the Kings games many times and yep. just very gracious with the fans. So happy to see him get a championship. So uh, that'll be really cool to see him honored. Yeah, I can't wait for that. All right, buddy. Uh, I'm sure I'll be talking to you on Listen Up in just a little bit tonight here after the uh, Kings game and the Lakers. Appreciate your insight. We'll talk to you soon. Indeed. Thanks, Green. And uh, happy Veterans Day to all the veterans out there for the serve for our country. We really, really appreciate it. And the reason we have our freedom. So thank you. Good stuff with there from uh, Rhino and Sacktown. That's going to wrap up uh, today's show. Don't forget after the game tonight, I'll be right back here on YouTube Live. So long, everybody. Have yourself a fabulous, fabulous weekend.